This is a podcast produced by Visionaries Norway. Hi guys, welcome to the last episode of season two. Thank you for sticking with us to the bitter end. Although it's probably not the end because maybe there will be some more episodes in the future. Who knows? My name is Thomas Tert and I'm producing these episodes on behalf of Visionaries Norway. And you can contact us or check out the stuff that we do on our webpage at www.visionaries.no or our Facebook page. And actually, you can now even send us an email if you want to. The address is post at visionaries.no. In this last episode, we have received a few questions from you guys. And basically, this is a Q&A episode. So we've sat Daniel down um, and fired a couple of questions at him. So without further ado, here's Daniel Kish, here's myself, and here's the answers to some of the questions that you have been asking. If you have any questions in the future, you need to let us know. Enjoy. So we're in Norway and uh, sometimes the weather in Norway is above zero. <laughs> Often it's it's below. I have noticed. Yes. So what um, is is there challenges with using echolocation or the cane when it's snowing in in blizzards in in rain in wind? How does weather affect mobility? I think those things, the weather affects everyone's mobility to a degree. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, it is a matter of developing skill. It's a matter of believing you can do it, for one thing. I, I'm from California, so we don't have weather there. But I have worked <laughs> in all conditions, from northern Canada to, uh, well, everywhere. I've worked everywhere. So I, I've had a lot of experience with weather. And one thing I will say... Um, with regard to uh, using the cane is it, it's really more a matter of experience than anything else. Mm. Um, the more you use your cane, the more experience you have. Uh, and so uh, I teach a certain kind of cane technique, which I call feather touch, which is a very light touch, which makes it easier to use the cane in pretty much any imaginable circumstance, any kind of weather, any kind of terrain. Uh, and e even even snow. Um, I can't demonstrate that here on the program, but it just has to do with a light touch, really, is what it amounts to. Um, if you have a heavy-handed cane technique, you're going to have a hard time in snow because your cane's just going to stick mm. all the time everywhere. So the lighter the touch, the more gracefully you'll be able to get through snow. Echolocation, that part's easy. Um, because while it is true that snow in and of itself doesn't reflect a lot of sound, um, it sounds a bit like foam, actually, mm. all other surfaces do continue to reflect in the same way. In fact, if anything, they, they pop, they stand out. So you have a snowscape. And then within that snowscape, you have other surfaces, trees, buildings, whatever. All of those things are going to be just as echolocatable as uh, they would be if it wasn't snowing mm. or if, if the snow wasn't happening. So um, I'm not... And we can use those cues to know where things are more easily if, if the sidewalk has disappeared because the snow has covered it up you still have building lines and tree lines and things to to orient off of and so i haven't found snow to be a particularly strong impediment against mobility or the use of echolocation now wind and driving rain more so um with wind you just have to scan a lot really I mean, mm. you just have to move your head and you have to get different samplings of your surroundings a lot that's that's a practiced skill and i would hope that anyone who grows up in environments where there is a lot of wind would practice that skill i didn't have access to a lot of wind until i moved to university and where i went to university there was a lot of wind 
And so I developed that skill. And I also developed the skill to travel in rain in the same way. So so basically, weather shouldn't be an issue. But weather is not a it's not a good enough excuse for blind people not to get outside. Well, I would hope so. I, I would hope that it wouldn't be, or you'd be just stuck inside for half the year. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and but but one other thing I would want to say about weather is is how we dress, mm -hmm. and to just be aware that blind people um, use their bodies, our, our hands, our feet. You know, our, and so often uh, in the interest of of caring for our children, we'll bundle them up, you know, and we'll yeah. just lots and hats and gloves and scarves. And before you know it, your kids are just a big bundle of stuff. And but we never think to cover up our sighted kids eyes, you know, <laughs> of course not. in the bundling. You know, we don't you, you wouldn't think to do that. And yet we will cover up our blind kids ears and mm -hmm. their hands and have them in just lots and lots of clothing. And I would just caution us to be aware that our blind kids really are dependent on their, on using their hands and their, and their ears. Mm. Um, it's not so much a dependency, it's just a sensible, natural thing. And so, and so to try to keep our gloves as, as thin as possible and the ear coverings as little as possible um, scarves, not really a problem. Hats, not a problem. But when that hat comes down over the ears, it becomes a problem. Mm. Hoods that come up over the ears. So just, just think, you know, think before we cover up the sensory receptors of our blind children, because we are creating a hearing impairment, you know, or a touch impairment mm. if they can't use their hands or their ears. So how far, from how far away can you hear uh, things with echolocation for how far away can you hear a building for instance how far away do you need to be for it not to show up yeah so it depends on how reflective a surface is it's like for sighted people you know the more reflective a surface the further away it can be and you still can see it mm -hmm. so so something the size of a building like a proper building mm. uh, with a tongue click you can probably detect a building from about a hundred meters mm -hmm. with a hand clap or one of those hand clickers I showed earlier, two to 300 meters, mm. maybe even further. It depends also on how noisy the environment is around you. For all practical purposes, the simple answer is far enough for yeah. a structure that size. Okay. Um, and the bigger it is, the further away you can be and still detect it. Mm. Now, and and the implications of that are are immense because there's no more being lost in open space. There's no more I can't find my way across the field or I can't find my way across, you know, a big car park or parking lot or whatever. It's 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 just about where are my spatial boundaries around me and I should be able to detect those potentially for hundreds of meters with the right kind of signal. The smaller the object, the closer you have to be. Something, for example, the size of a a person maybe or a pole mm. say a signpost um would be more like three meters or four meters mm -hmm. maybe five meters um but far enough away that you're not going to run into it that's yeah that just reminds me so i i was walking down the road the other day and there was a lady rushing up beside me and say be careful there's a car in front of, there is a parked car in front of you and i said uh that's that's okay i will detect it when i get close enough either i will hear it or my cane will reach it and she said okay and and sort of you know kept walking a couple of steps behind me and when we we approached the new car she she then rushed up again and said be careful 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 you're gonna hit it and i really had to explain to her that it, you know I understand your fear because you see the car before I hear the car. But when I hear the car, I'm still far enough away to not run into the car. Absolutely. And yes. that just struck me as being um, an, an important thing to know that although, so for a sighted person, sometimes it will look as though, it will appear as though a blind person is in danger. But most of the time it's because we need to get closer or we're, we're, we're detecting 
objects in a different manner, basically. That's right. That's right. And 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 particularly for parents or spouses, we jump in too soon. We jump in too early, and every time we do that, we short circuit or usurp or we get rid of the opportunity for individuals to figure it out for themselves. Mm. So that brings me on to another question. So as as parents, we um, we love our kids, you know, mm. <laughs> obviously, and we mm. want the best for our kids. You've said you've spoken a lot about um, helping the most by helping the least. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate a bit on that? So if I love my child, why wouldn't I help my child all the time? It comes back to how much freedom do we want our children to have? Um, you know, it, it, so we love our kids. Love is an emotion. Love should also be a logical thing. It should not just be an emotional thing. Mm. It should contain wisdom as well as compassion. Mm. So, uh, you know, do we give a starving person a fish or do we teach them how to fish? Mm -hmm. Do we give them fruit or do we teach them how to grow fruit? Well, one is compassionate and the other is wisdom. So with our children, do we hold their hands through their childhood? Do we stand between them and every possible danger? Do we um, s provide a safety net, you know, all the time, wherever they go, whatever they do? Well, okay, I guess that's okay if you plan to live with and care for your child for the rest of his or her life. <laughs> then maybe that makes sense, but I think two things a that's not practical and b it's not providing our child with the choice for them to access their own freedom mm -hmm. so um i would uh, urge that we think about our blind children as not only becoming capable competent um, people but honoring and respecting that development by teaching them how to fish mm -hmm. effectively, by teaching them how to grow their own fruit. So if we're holding their hand until they're, good gosh, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, I mean, I see it, you know, all the time, or if we're not allowing them to participate in activities, or if we're constantly hovering over them, or if we pay for taxis for them to go everywhere, we're not doing them a service. We're not doing them a favor. Another way I put it is a simple equation. Okay, raising a child is, is, uh, is like this human equation. If we put in dependency and restriction, if we put that into one end of the equation, into one end of child development, there is no magic moment where that gets transformed into independence and freedom at the other end mm. you're going to get out of it what you put into it and it's pretty simple and it's pretty reliable so if we put in opportunities for independence and for freedom of choice uh in in the front end that's what will get out the other end mm. That's what will will yield. And and another thing I'd like to say about that is is back to the emotional part. Um, many people express all kinds of emotions around blindness. Blindness seems to be a, a a it seems to push people's buttons for emotions like anger or fear or sadness. And <clears throat> I'm here to tell you that a child. In particular, a child who goes blind, that's not necessarily what they experience. Children just adapt. I've seen it many, many times. Mm -hmm. Children will adapt. Blindness, pain, loss. Children don't, don't process that the same way that grown-ups do. So what they do is they take the lead from us. And so if we are sad and if we are fearful... Uh, and if we are confused, and if we are angry, 
then yeah, you can expect your children, your blind child to take that on. Yeah. But if we are, if we continue to celebrate our children, which I'd hope we would, if we continue to, to be excited for them, to have hope for them, to have dreams for them, to honor their capacities and not get stuck in our own selves around blindness. What we may think about blindness isn't the point. It doesn't matter. What matters is what our children grow up to think about blindness. That is what matters. And so we as parents who get stuck in our own emotionalism, well, I mean, it's a bit self-oriented in a way. Mm. And we just have to to emotionally get out of ourselves and try to add logic to the equation, become wise in how we love our children into their capacity, into their abilities. Sometimes loving is letting go. Loving is letting go, yeah. It is, it is. It's, some, some people put it this way, are we choosing between fear and love? Mm -hmm. my parents didn't raise me out of fear they raised me out of love which mm -hmm. meant that they respected my freedom which meant that uh, there were many times when I was allowed to fall mm -hmm. and the more uh, I, I, I've been quoted as saying running into a pole is a drag but never being allowed to run into a pole is a disaster mm -hmm. one is an injury that heals quickly the other is an injury that is very very difficult to heal So sometimes moving still on the help um, on the help subject, but so when we are out as blind people walking on the street, I, I guess we all <laughs> many, many, many times get offered help. Um, I, I was the other day, I, 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 um, I was outside a, a gas station. I was going to get picked up actually by you and, and, and another guy called Preben, who is the leader of Visionaries Norway. Anyway, um, I was outside the gas station and I wanted to go inside just because it was cold. And I was on my way to the door and this huge guy comes up. He's, I mean, I mean he's huge. He's like a two meter tall, muscular kind of guy. Gorilla. Yeah, gorilla. And he, he, he basically almost picks me up. He's like, he, he, he holds my, my arm and, and I feel that this is a grip I can get out well I, I could probably get out of it but it would be a very <laughs> violent situation and he says oh, I'm just gonna take you inside because it's cold and you need help and and just almost carries me through the door <laughs> and puts me on the floor yeah, yeah. and and at that situation I thought you know I have to pick my battles this is not a battle that I want to engage there's just no point in in this because he's <laughs> it's just holding on to me However, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that because in my opinion, when people offer me help, it's virtually 100% of the time because, I mean, they, they, they don't want to hurt me or they, they don't want me to have a bad experience. They just want to help because in their eyes, I, I need help from their perspective. I need help. However, that's not always the case. Like we talked about earlier, you know, sometimes we we detect cars later than sighted people just because we need to get closer. So how, how would your approach be on when you're being offered help and people don't take no for a no? Oh, that's, there's <laughs> that's no a, yeah, there's no perfect answer to that. I mean, yeah. I think, I think a lot of that has to do with um, the gracefulness and graciousness of how we engage people. So, Sometimes you, I mean, the energy that we put forward, sometimes you can, you can dismiss someone with a smile. And in your case, that might not have worked. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, in other cases, it, it is just simply smiling and saying, you know, really, I'm okay. Um, I'm okay. And, and, and it's often that casual 
disregard, not disregard, the, a casual, um, a casual knowing within ourselves that there's no crisis here. <laughs> and many people will respond to our energy, not everyone. But many people, you know, if it isn't a crisis to me, why should it be a crisis to you? Mm. Um, so, again, I wax philosophical, but I find that that often, often works. If I'm, you know, presenting myself in a relaxed yet vigilant way, so I'm calmly focused, that energy is often quite contagious for people. Now, more practically speaking, you know, sometimes I've been in situations where someone wants to move me. Hmm. Physically. Physically, exactly, yes. And I just don't move, you know. So, I mean, I just... Unless they literally want to pick me up and carry me, if I don't move, I become a bit of dead weight pretty quickly. And then it becomes this weird dragging thing, which will kind of get the attention of most people that this is a problem. Again, if you're being handled, manhandled by a gorilla, it might be a different story. But, you know, I mean, you're not such a small guy yourself either. Yeah. And so... Um, it, well, let's just say you didn't want to go inside. Let's say you yeah. were waiting for someone and you you wanted to be visible for this person and you really, truly, it wasn't going to work to be inside. Yeah. Then it's it's a, a really a combination between not being movable and just explaining that the person you're waiting for is coming soon or whatever you have to say to get this guy off your back. Um, it's not easy. I mean, a lot of it's just very casual, smi smiling. You know, when we get tough and surly, it never brings out the best in people. Yeah. Um, if we get really frustrated, it never brings out the best in people. So I, I just find that being... Um, I, I keep using the term graceful, you know, just being, being uh, pleasant in a situation uh, is most likely to bring out the best in people. I think also uh, maybe a part of it psychologically is that I've seen in myself, not so much anymore, but um, some years ago that uh, I, since I wasn't like before, before I learned to echolocate and before I got comfortable with the cane, I would almost feel as though <laughs> this sighted person walking over to me knows more than I do. Uh -huh. They're more capable. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I, I and, and I think this is maybe the case for other blind people as well, that we we consider ourselves to be, I, I shouldn't say less intelligent, but, you know, um, well, they offered us help, so maybe they have a reason for it that we don't know and we should just offer it because we don't, don't want to piss off anyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there is that too. I mean, there is, there, like you said, picking your battles. Everyone picks their battles. Um, and this, what you did in that particular situation may really truly have been the best thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's also a little bit of when in Rome, do what the Romans do. I mean, I might respond to a situation like that very differently in, say, the Ukraine than I would in, say, Mexico, mm. because there are very, very different cultural imperatives in both places. Um, and sometimes it's best to do as the Romans do, you know, until you kind of understand Rome. Now, you were in Norway, uh, so it's a little bit of a different situation there, but you still don't know the parameters of the person you're dealing with yeah. necessarily. So yeah, so it's a, it's an interaction. Uh, it, it does ultimately though, come down to our skill level. Mm -hmm. What is our skill level? What is our capacity to really be confidently competent in this situation? If we have, the ability to be confidently competent in a situation, then we have more options always when it comes to situations like that. Mm.
what's the biggest challenge with being blind? People. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, because I, I, I've been blind all my life and I, I've just never really felt blindness to be very much its own challenge. I mean, yeah, okay, it's challenging, but life is challenging. Everyone has challenges. Everyone struggles in some form or other with something. And I, and so I find that blindness in and of itself doesn't really form the major limitation. Um, someone somewhere once said that blindness is a social construction, meaning that many of the the barriers and difficulties that blind people face are socially imposed, not physically imposed. And I'd say that's true. Um, it really, it's, it really has a lot to do with the attitude of the people around us, what they expect, what they impose, what they assume or presume. Those really are, in my experience and from what I've observed, those really are the biggest obstacles. The biggest obstacles aren't the physical supposed limitations that we associate with blindness. It's really about what people think about it. You have listened to a podcast produced by Visionaries Norway. Please follow us on Facebook or check out our webpage at www.visionaries.no if you have any feedback or want to support the work that we do. Thank you for listening.